Well, good evening, everybody. I'm so happy to see you, believe me. Um, so this has been, this has been so good. Um, this session one is going to be a lot of introductory material, but I will unpack it as we go on. So allow me to do that. I want to begin, first of all, by telling you this is my first time hosting a Zoom. And uh, man, oh man, did I sweat till I found this wonderful young lady, Yvette Jackson, who is our communications director for the eparchy. She's just the best. She knows how to do this. And she's going to um, basically break into the talk, et cetera, when we need to. She'll control muting and unmuting and Yvette, you're the best, I'll tell you. She's great. I, I need to tell you, she has three young children, and um, also she lives in California. So we're praying for you. You guys have got three digits over there, temperature. <clears throat> and I told her, at the risk of being very, I don't know what, I said, we had 75 today. It was heaven. I think Don, Father Don, you had that uh, similar today down in Austin. Okay, so there's Yvette. She's going to help me out tonight. I also need to thank uh, Bishop Zidane. And the reason is um, my Zoom, um, I always have to be careful about TMI, but my Zoom app was limited, uh, limited number of people and limited number of minutes to present. So when I posed that to Yvette, she talked to Bishop um, Zidane, and we're using the eparchy Zoom. So thanks for arranging that, Yvette. That's great. You're welcome. No problem. Okay. All right. So I want to say by way of introduction, what I'm going to say now for uh, maybe, I don't know how many minutes, but maybe about 20 minutes, sounds like as they say, it's all about me, but it's not going to be all about me. I'm going to talk about me and my education. And the reason I'm doing that is because this is very interesting. When I was in seminary, I entered seminary uh, in 1962, which was the first year of the council. What an exciting time that was. And so we were able to to follow along as that was going on. After I did six years at the Roman Catholic Seminary here locally, then I went out to our seminary in Washington, DC. So I'm what they call a lifer, 12, 12 uh, years. I tell some people I should be a Jesuit, but I, I shouldn't tell people that. <laughs> but uh, I spent a long time in seminary, but it was a really exciting time. And I'm going to tell you some of the things that happened in my formation. And I want you to think not only of what happened to me, but what happened to all of us, particularly in the Eastern churches and the Maronite church as well. So um, the, the seminary here locally was called Nazareth Hall. And then our seminary is called Our Lady of Lebanon. It's in Washington, D.C. In my opinion, I'm, I'm, a staunch, I'm a staunch supporter of the work of Vatican II. But Vatican II produced 16 very important documents, not all the same importance, you know, some were more important than others. But for me, the two documents, I think, were the document on the Eastern Catholic Churches. Many people don't even know that the, that the council um, uh, dealt with that. And then the second, uh, the second one is the, the document Dei Verbum, which means the word of God. And it's been important for me because I love to preach and I love to learn about the scriptures. And uh, that's a very magnificent document. The other thing we need to know, I think, about what Vatican II told us about the makeup of the church. Um, 
we began after Vatican II to speak about a communion of churches. That's very important for us to know that, a communion of churches. And what does that mean? It means there are actually, sometimes it changes a little bit depending on the community number, but 23 different churches that make up the universal Catholic church. Some people don't know that. And some people think the Catholic church is just Latin. We know better as Eastern right people, but I don't know if we have really internalized that. And part of that, this is part of that to make us aware of the Eastern churches as equal churches to the Latin church, not in size, but in importance. So it's, now I, the people uh, who are my age in this group right now know that they studied that in seminary, but some of you may not know that. And it's good for us to rehearse that and uh, to, to do that. So uh, the Catholic church is a communion of churches bound together with each other and then all of us bound to the man in white in Rome, the Holy Father, okay? Um, I need to say right now too that you need to know, and the last three popes have been very, very adamant about this. They sign their documents as Bishop of Rome, not Pope of Rome. That's really important because they're reaching out ecumenically the Bishop of Rome, he is the head bishop of the Catholic Church. And so we are under his guidance. So that's really important in this idea of uh, the communion of churches. Here's the last thing that I want to say. My good friend, St. John the 23rd, said something one time, which when I first heard it, like years and years ago, just hit me between the eyes. And those of you that were able to come to my workshop at the NAM convention heard me say this over and over again. Here's what, see John the 23rd was a diplomat in different places in the church before he was elected Pope. And part of that was dealing with the Eastern, Eastern churches, Catholic and Orthodox. And so one time he said to the Eastern Catholic churches, get this now, become what you are. I don't know if anyone ever has heard that, but to me, it's fabulous. Become what you are. So he was saying, if you're Eastern, right, and it, and it applies to, to the Latin church too, but you know, um, you are who you are as a church within the communion of churches. And if you don't know what you are, then you need to become who you are. I think that's just fabulous. Um, so those are the introductory remarks that I wanted to say about um, my seminary training during those years of Vatican II. They were invaluable to me. I was ordained in 1974, a little bit of background. I served full time in six parishes over 40, um, 45 years, and I still serve here in the Twin Cities, um, our parish in St. Paul which is in Mendota Heights. And our pastor is right there, Father Emmanuel. And um, somewhere, I don't know where he went, but uh, um, Core Bishop Charbel Maroon. So those are two good pastors here in the United States. And um, I serve alternately in both parishes. It's wonderful to be able to serve those um, in ministry. So I also had another life. I have to be very careful how I say this. I had a double life. The double life was religious education. And I served in the eparchy for many, many years. And for many years, I was actually the director of religious education for um, at one time, both eparchies. It started out with one, but then two. So I have a lot of experience in, in um, religious education. I, I don't say that to brag. I try to bring those gifts to my ministry, always did. But um, I think it's really important that we know that um, adult faith formation is very important for the church. Okay. And so um, those of you that are involved in that know that. 
And uh, so uh, I'm still in that, still doing that. Many of you may know that I wrote a book and published it in 2002 called Captivated by Your Teachings. Anybody here see, see a show of hands? There are some of you. Yes, I bore you with that all the time. Uh, but it was an attempt to address adult faith formation in the Maronite, Syriac Maronite context. Also recently, at the beginning of this year, um, I, had pu I published an article um, in a um, journal, and uh, this is a really interesting, a Russian Orthodox journal <laughs> that's business is um, adult, adult faith formation, St. Philorite Institute in Moscow. And um, the name of it was, when I tell you the name, you kind of see where I'm, I'm going with this, but it was reimagining adult faith formation in the Syriac Maronite Church, which was the topic of the workshop at NAM. So those are the two things I wanted to share with you. All right. So I have a question for you. And unfortunately, the way we're doing this, we're not going to take the time right now to discuss it. But at the end, when we have time for questions and answers, I want you to be thinking about this as we go along. And the question is very simple. What brought you here today? Why are you in this Zoom? Why are you listening to me at this, okay? Um, you all have different reasons for this. And so I would be interested if you wanna talk about that at the end, it's all, especially people who've not been Maronites, um, why are you here? Okay, the next thing I wanna talk about is real interesting. Having said my part of my formation, from 62 to 74, I usually tell people, I learned my theology after my theology. <laughs> and what do I mean by that? My theological training at Catholic University was all Western. It was good. I learned a lot of things. But then I said, is this who I am? And so I needed to begin to look at who I was as a Syriac Maronite Catholic. I want to share with you, um, Yvette, this is, this is number one, posting number one. Will you put that up on the screen, please? There we go. It's kind of long, but it's also in, <laughs> it's also in a big font. Um, is the are the is the gallery blocking any of this or can you see it all? No, they can see it. They can see it. Good. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this was written by a, a colleague of mine, Father Ron Bashara, who has now passed on to the kingdom, but a very smart man. But we were going through the seminary at the same time, and. Um, let me read this. It's really well to read the whole thing. The last time I had the privilege of attending a Syriac symposium was in 1980 at Dun Dumbarton Oaks, that's in Washington. There for the first time, I experienced a deeper sense of appreciation of my own Syriac Maronite church and tradition. After hearing several provocative and insightful presentations on Christianity, namely, and the, the um, seminar was called East of, Byz East of Byzantium in the formative period. So it's, it, would, it would be um, including that part of the Middle East that was east of the New Rome, the capital, Byzantium or Constantinople. So east of Byzantium in the formative period. I vividly, this is father writing. I vividly recall one evening when we were dining with Dr. Sebastian Brock and several Maronite peers, having said to them, for the first time in my adult life, I feel validated as a Syriac Christian. For so long, it seemed I was making it all up and it was merely an illusion. 
the symposium highlighted the significantly rich and influential Syriac church with, it, with its unique spirituality, profound liturgy, poetic hymnology, and beautiful iconography. I then added, I was beginning to believe that we, working in isolation for so long, had made, uh, made it all up to justify our experience as our existence as Maronites. Worse yet, Maronites from the Crusades to Vatican II became less an Eastern and Syriac tradition due to centuries of Romanization, that is, Latinization. There was the added dilemma of the Syriac tradition being long overlooked or identified with the Byzantine tradition. There's a lot, there's a lot in this, and I don't know how you're reacting to this, but if you could read this again, I'd be happy to send it to you. You could see what was being said here. Not only were the other Eastern churches identified with the Byzantine tradition, as if we were Byzantine, we didn't have a tradition of our own, but here's what happened with Rome. Rome considered, before Vatican II, the Eastern churches were just adapt, adapted, tweaked um, versions of the Roman rite. It's really, it's really important for us to see that. One word that we used to use, and if anyone here ever says it again, I'll turn you off. The word is uniate. Um, and uniate means that's the way Rome was trying to bring in the Eastern Catholic churches to say we are just, I'm going to say it again, tweaked versions of the Latin rite. So that's all changed now. We do not use the word uniate anymore. So it's really important that I say that at this point. All right. Now, I'd like to turn to another really interesting thing. And this is a quote from um, Pope John, uh, John Paul II. And um, you might have heard this somewhere along the line, but he says, the church needs to breathe with both lungs. Alternately, alternatively, church needs to be the, I like this other, he, he, he quoted another one too. He, I, you don't hear it too much, but the church needs to be two beating ventricles of one heart. Isn't that lovely? I think it's, it's quite poetic, actually. But what he was trying to say is that we can no longer uh, ignore our brothers and sisters in the Eastern churches. They're just as important as we are, but um, we, have to, we have to pay attention. So uh, two, two lungs. All right. Now, what happened? What happened after the council, just before the council and during the council, there was a tremendous explosion of um, an exploration of the Syriac church. And uh, many people, I'm going to give you the list of some of the writers at the end of this that are doing some really good work there. But um, so a lot of Syriac works from the fathers like Afrahat, I'll talk about him later, Ephraim, of course, James of Sarug, and others, they were translated into English. And what a blessing that was for us. Okay, we can get a lot of, of that in there now. And so it's available. I want to, I want to say at this moment, I sent a bibliography to all of you uh, who were early in the game saying you wanted to come to this. Um, and uh, I'm going to advert to it during the six weeks. But if you haven't received that, um, I want to give you my email address and I'll be very happy to send it to you. I can see with the people who are here that you've already gotten that, but not all of you have. So my, um, excuse me, my um, email address is Sergius, S-E-R-G-I-U-S, 
1567 at gmail.com. Let me repeat that. Sergius, S E R G I U S 1567 at gmail.com. You can talk to me about anything either, you know, um, but uh, I'll, I'll be happy to send it to you if you didn't. Hmm. Father Anthony, I'm also adding it to the chat. So if anyone wants to download oh. the bibliography directly from there, you can do so. Okay. And uh, Father Anthony's email is also there. Good. You should have this bibliography because it's a good bibliography and treats of a lot of the things we're going to talk about in the next uh, five weeks. And um, it's good to have if you're doing work, you know, in this area. Okay. So having said all that, I want to talk about one extremely, I can't tell you how much I appreciate this. This is um, a book called, it's by, it's by Robert Murray. He's on the bibliography. Robert Murray, Symbols of Church and Kingdom. And it's a big book, but the introduction is worth the whole thing. He is really wonderful. And I have found in, in reading different things by other authors, they always quote him. Symbols of Church and Kingdom. Just marvelous. And uh, so I want to give you two quotes from Murray. And so now, Yvette, will you post number two? Okay. Everybody see it? I hope so. It is hardly an exaggeration to say that theological study of the early Syriac fathers is still in its infancy. The scholars who at any time have been capable of such work have naturally mainly been occupied in the preliminary work of producing satisfactory editions, and many of them have, in any case, been philologists, studies of language. He's saying most of these studies have been philology um, rather than theologians. Critical editions of many authors have appeared and only comparatively recently most of the authentic works of St. Ephraim, for example, have become available in reliable editions only since about 1950. I, I think that's amazing. Thanks mainly to the work of Dom Edmund Beck and Dom Louis Le Loir. They were the two forerunners of this. These two scholars have also given us more than half of the essays in, oh my, hold on. Oh, in the, okay, I'm gonna have to move this because why didn't this all come out in my own sheet? Half of the essay, essays and theological interpretation of Ephraim, which can be judged models for the future. Okay, so I think he's saying a lot now. There's a second paragraph that's also very, very important from the same text, um, Symbols of Church and Kingdom. It is in this situation of new opportunity in a largely undeveloped field that the present work seeks to make its contribution to a wider understanding and appreciation of an important and influential part of the early Christian world. Hmm. How influential Syriac Christianity has been, every student of comparative uh, liturgy in general and of Byzantine hymnography in particular is well aware. But literature which contains the first flowering of that poetic tradition has received little critical study of its literary forms and imagery and of their likely origin. In the present work, I have concentrated on one of the richest field, fields of symbolic expression in early Syriac literature, that referring to the church. So his book is about 
Symbols of Church and Kingdom. Um, this book was written qu quite a few years now because the fact is, I use the word explosion, explosion of studies. It's really true, really true. So um, you can look on the bibliography, ask me about it or whatever. Um, okay, now I want to talk about the people who are writing in the field. I know you won't know many of these people, but you need to be familiar because you're gonna see names, especially if you continue to um, study in the Syriac tradition, the Syriac church tradition. So um, Yvette, we need uh, to post number three. Okay. Again, those of you that have been doing some work in, in this field uh, will know some of these names. Um, Core Bishop Sili Bejani. He was the rector of the seminary when I was going through the seminary. And uh, also a couple of you, I, can, I know that. Um, he's, he's really a scholar. Nina Garosian and William McComber, those were the two that organized this, um, this uh, symposium that I talked about at the beginning of um, in Dun Dumbarton Oaks, Oaks, uh, amazing. The third one is probably Bishop, Core Bishop Seely, if you're listening, I don't mean any offense, but I think he'd probably agree. Sebastian Brock, Sebastian Brock is probably the preeminent scholar on Syriac writers and matters in English. I mean, just anything he writes is wonderful and it's clear you can understand it he's a gift to the church he is a syriac orthodox but he shares uh the common syriac um, tradition the next one joseph amar was my um Joe, joe was my um colleague and my classmate at catholic university but he's one of the foremost scholars in um, especially Ephraim, um, just amazing. He taught at Notre Dame for many, many years. He's retired now. And he did um, work with Ed Matthews too. Uh, and he did a wonderful book on the prose writings of St. Ephraim, Joseph Amar and Ed Matthews. Also, <clears throat> Sidney Griffith is a wonderful scholar and he just has a wonderful way of writing too. And um, if you see anything by Sidney Griffith, I'll be quoting something from him in one of the days. Um, you'll see what I mean. Kathleen McVeigh it was at Catholic University, um, a wonderful scholar. So those of you that are women in the group, please don't think it's only a men's club. There have been really some important women writing in the area. And Kathleen McVeigh is one of them. And the other is Susan Ashbrook Harvey. Um, she is a marvelous writer. She's important, and I'm going to come to it later, but um, Susan Harvey has studied Ephraim, and especially his writings as they were able to spread the faith, defend the faith, and spread the faith um, in a very, very good way that people could, could uh, uh, understand. She's really very good. I've already uh, spoken about Robert Murray. Um, the next is Armando El Huri, who is the um, vice rector of our seminary. And he's an expert in um, Jacob of Sarug. And he just, he and Robert Kitchen just um, published a book on the writings of, of uh, Jacob of Sarug. Really, really well done. I don't know this next guy. But I can tell you, he wrote a book called Captivated by Your Teachings. It's a catechetical work. So um, some of you have seen it. Peter J. L. Khoury, um is a lawyer in Sydney, Australia. And uh, I worked in Australia for a year and I got to know Peter very well. And he's just published uh, less than two years ago, a book called Ara Aramaic Catholicism. 
Now, if you start reading this book, he knows that Aramaic and Syriac are so closely related, of course, but he chooses to use Aramaic Catholicism, and uh, especially as we see it in the Maronite tradition. Finally, I want to talk to you about uh, an, an, a man who has a very interesting name, Baby Varghese. <laughs> he's, he's an Indian, and Jay Velian, they're both Indians. And I need to tell you that much good work currently is being done in India, especially in the Kerala course, uh, coast, which is the southeastern coast of India. And I'm going to come back to a very important work that two, two very important works as we go along, Baby Varghese and Jay Velian. Okay, thanks, Yvette. All right. Well, I actually, I could go into class two, but I'm not going to. Rather, I'm going to come back to our quest, two questions. Um, uh, the first question is, why did you come here today? And if you've done a, if you've done a Syriac Zoom before, you must be interested because you're back again. I know Carol's jumping out of her seat, but uh, she she's a, she's good she's very interesting here's the other question and i need you to post it please yvette and then we're gonna have some dialogue on this it's uh number four okay here's a reflection question and the reflection question is this what does become who you are mean for me meaning all of you and me, especially if I'm an Eastern Rite Catholic and particularly a Maronite participant in this Zoom class. I want to do it again, then maybe, I don't know, maybe we might leave it up. Uh, so what does become who you are mean for me, especially if I, oops, it went away. As, especially if I'm an Eastern Rite Catholic and particularly a Maronite participation, participant in this Zoom class. Okay, um, I'm turning this over to Yvette now. She will let you speak if you want. And there's, so I, a, pro, there's a process for doing this. I've also put the question in the chat for anyone that can see it. And I also have your article that you wrote, um, Father Anthony, so I will share that as well. Oh. Reimagining Adult Faith. Oh, oh thank so you. I got yeah, that, one. that was pretty interesting to do. So if anyone uh, would like to speak, please raise your hand. It's the reactions button at the bottom of your screen, and then I will unmute you. Or if anyone would like to answer the reflection. Okay, George, go ahead. George raised a hand. This is George who? You're unmuted. You're unmuted, go ahead. Okay, so uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Father Anthony, for continuing the good work. Uh, we appreciate it very much. Um, as far as what it means, uh, it's... Um, of course, it means going back to the roots, as uh, you had explained in the lecture. But uh, it also means um, kind of uh, revisiting what we may already have heard in the land that we live in, in the West, uh, reliving it in a, in a different lens, in a different light. Uh, you mentioned you learned your theology after theology. And, I wasn't joking. And it's uh, very true. It's very true. Uh, I, I could completely understand that. But I think uh, uh, we are still uh, emerged in, in the presence of the West and in the method of methodology of the West. And to be truly uh, Eastern, it's uh, not easy. It's never, never has been. It seems like we've always been enmeshed against you know, greater or greater uh, cultural influences, whether it be Islam or, you know, uh, whether it, even if it's, uh, even if it's Christian or Catholic, 
it still can diminish if, if we don't uh, uphold that uh, particular strand of our Catholic faith. And I feel in this land here, because so many of our parishioners are, can go to a Western Catholic church and still get their Sunday obligation, that is a real uh, strangler on uphold, upholding the uh, Eastern flavor amongst the, the, the faithful and uh, being born and raised here and going through Catholic schools here, I, I can see how it's very easy not to get hooked into it. So I think uh, not only is it to go back to our roots, like what everyone was saying and the, and what was meant from Vatican II even, but it's how can we um, uh, grow the roots in the West and let it uh, blossom amongst the, the Latins. So I think that's what it uh, particularly is a meaning for uh, for for myself and in, and in particular for my kids to see them really want to say uh, let's go to the Maronite church rather than let's go to the Latin church that's literally uh, 0.7 of a mile from my house or instead of driving 45-50 minutes uh, up to St. Maron on a Over Sunday. expressway. Right. Yeah. So that's that's a big, big challenge. And I, I, I don't know how other parents do it if they didn't have classes like what we're having with you. It's tough. I don't know how they're doing it. And I have to figure out how to do what you're doing, Abuna, which is uh, spread it somehow. So I think that's what it means. How do we, how do we keep it alive in the West uh, and, and still breathe in both lungs while we're here? So. Well, I didn't say this, and I, I for, please forgive me. Sebastian Brock has reshaped human anatomy. He says, now we have to breathe with three lungs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know cows have four stomachs, but. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but you see his point, yeah. you know, yeah. yeah. It's, it's easy to understand the two as Byzantine and Latin, but probably not as much, you know, Syriac or Aramaic. Yeah, I think that, um, I think clearly that John Paul II was a devotee of the Eastern churches. Uh, Will, uh, you have things in your bibliography you'll see that are just marvelous that he wrote. But when he s talked about the two lungs, I just want to finesse this a little bit, George. Uh, he didn't mean just Latin and Byzantine. He meant Latin and Eastern in general. And then the many uh, flavors under Eastern. But now... Brock is saying that third lung is Syriac. And man, when Brock talks, we got to listen. So is he saying that Syriac from Latin, Byzantine, Syriac, mm -hmm. those three, like that? Uh, he's saying, no, he's, he, well, I guess so. I don't want to get too, um, uh, I don't know what to say, involved in the anatomy. But <laughs> he's, he also should have said, um, it should be um, one lung and five other lungs, <laughs> Armenian, Coptic. Right. So the whole idea is to appreciate the Eastern churches as opposed to the Latin church. And not in, please never, you'll never hear me say in this six weeks, anything negative about the Latin church. One of the things that I learned from being six years in the Latin seminary, and I see some of my classmates here, um, was the ability to be able to think critically, you know, and try to bring that to this enterprise. So, but just so you know, George is a subdeacon and he's headed towards priesthood and we, um, we hope you're going to make it, George. God willing. God willing, is right. Anybody else? We did have a comment from Samar that says, commenting on the last speaker, didn't Islam plagiarize from us? Excuse me, uh, looking for the right word and not vice versa, us taking from them. I am not an expert in Islam, but I think probably there are some people on this Zoom that are more involved in that. But I do know that 
the Quran does include many uh, things from the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, chicken or the egg? Well, who came before Islam? You know, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Father Don? Can you hear me? Can. Uh, well, we know what came first. <laughs> Judaism and Christianity, yeah. three options. Yeah. But it, and it's fascinating. There was a, a, a Muslim guy. He was out to study uh, this Bible so he could prove Christians were wrong. Mm. And it's fascinating. It's on the internet. He's an Indian fellow and who became Christian and was beaten up, almost killed by his own family. Um, but there's also an excellent book, um, uh, and it's misnamed uh, Byzantine uh, Syria um, churches in, in Syria, the Byzantine uh, period. But all it is by a Franciscan, a Spaniard. I'm trying to recall his name. You but gave it excellent. to me. You gave it to me. His yeah, name you have a copy. I gave you a copy. You of gave it. me the copy. It's Pena. And, Pena. Uh, Sir, it was. Um, it was Syriac art in the Byzantine Empire. Uh, in Syria, churches in Syria. Yeah, Byzantine. Anyway, it, it's excellent because he even talks about, he uh, talks about the architecture of the Syriac churches. Yep. Lent for the, for originally the minarets, he's claiming that the Muslims came and imitated uh, the starlights. Uh, yep. Simon and Daniel, the starlights. We're coming to them. <laughs> yeah, and, and they imitated them. And when they took over, Syria, it was like uh, Napa Valley, green, beautiful uh, vineyards all over the place. So they pulled the Christians down from from these pillars, and they had their people singing the Quran, and of course they imitated and become what we know as the minarets. They also imitated um, the Syriac churches. On the exterior, had it was like a a bulb attached to the wall, and it was a reliquary. So he was saying that's where the Maharib is located. And they borrowed that. Uh, and, and the Syriac churches used more a voice calling people to, to prayer and not so much bells at that time. So, yeah, you could see it all over. And even seeing the Quran, how much was borrowed and taken. And, exactly. Yeah. So definitely there is no question about which came first. Oh, I hope you didn't think that I, I waffled on that. It's obvious. Yeah, you did. Too. You did. I did. You offer for me at least. <laughs> oh, oh, we know historically. Maybe others. Came. Maybe others. You know, oh, Christianity <laughs> and Judaism came first. Of course. Yeah. Sorry, I apologize for that. But um, yeah, no, no. All right. Father Emmanuel, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Unmuted? Okay. Uh, going back to uh, Tony, what you're talking about, what George was talking about, one of the reasons I'm here and I explain this to Tony, I'm a classmate, six year lifer from NAS Hall, along with Clinton and Father Mraz. And uh, we've uh, we, we, we did the long haul of the myth, the Sisyphus here. Uh, but the reason that I came is we recently had, Tony and I uh, reunited. I was a graduate of American University. And uh, so I left the seminary after six, seven years and went out to American and reconnected with Tony. And Tony invited me over to Catholic University and introduced me to something called the Eastern Orthodox Church, of which I'm quite shocked that in retrospect, when I met back with Tony uh, approximately a year ago, I couldn't understand why in the seminary and as a practicing Catholic that I knew nothing about the Orthodox Church. Mm. I just thought, what is, you know, how could that happen? I mean, if, if I went through that intensive of an education and know nothing of the Orthodox Church, back to George's comment, where does that put the rest of the Catholic lay 
people in terms of this communion of churches. Uh, and then I, I don't know, Tony, if we went to lunch or did some other things and I, I got a hold of your book and I thought, wow, uh, this, this is like a, a phenomenal discovery. It's kind of like uh, opening up a new world, which again, intensified why don't in the Western Latin church, are we aware? Forget being knowledgeable or practicing or understanding the theology. Why aren't we more aware? So that's why, and Tony knows this, we've had lunch a couple of times since. I said, now it just so happens, there's an accident in life here. One of my old classmates turns out to be quite the expert or at least an extremely knowledgeable person in this and uh, time to jump in. So where I was going with this is until the Latin church, until the priests in Minneapolis and St. Paul began talking about the Orthodox church, until they start recommending or suggesting that with the parishes that Tony has explained to me and one of the first services I what, attended to of two weeks ago or so ever. Again, why two weeks ago at age 74 was I going to the very first Orthodox mass? Be, be, be careful, please. Let me jump in here, Tim. To be precise, I am a Catholic. Right. See, yeah, okay. It's true you didn't hear anything much about the Orthodox Church. That's true, too. But this whole thing is about the Catholic Church right now. Right. Now, we'll talk about the relationship of the Eastern Catholic Churches to the Eastern Orthodox Church. Mm -hmm. But you didn't hear anything of either. Uh, it, it just was a, uh, an educational point, really. Not a, I'm not a theologian or anything. So... Uh, it's just, I feel I've had this brother and I didn't know them as well as I should. And then the second question is, uh, certainly we talk about the US, but in the Eastern European areas and in some of the other areas of Europe, are they aware of the Latin church other than the popes there in Rome? Is there the same uh, is there the same isolation or lack of interaction to the Latin church? Because you mentioned John Paul or John the 23rd. Uh, what can I say? Reunited the communion of churches. And I'm wondering if that same degree of isolation was, well, that's the Latin church and we're the Eastern Church. And I can speak from our side, but I don't know from the other side. Yeah. That's well, it depends on the country, because there are some countries that are more Orthodox than Catholic, but they are aware of the Catholic Church. And certainly the last three popes have made it clear to the world that um, Catholicism is in the world and, and they're visiting these countries, you know. But uh, it, it depends uh, which country we're talking about. There's a lot of work to be done. I was amazed that my article, uh, they asked me to do my article in um, St. Philaret Institute, which is uh, uh, Russian Orthodox, but they're interested in how other traditions do adult faith formation. But um, we, we are slowly, slowly moving together, slowly. But I appreciate, I've always appreciated your comments, um, Tim. And, um, and where are we going to breakfast next? <laughs> uh, Father Emmanuel, you had uh, your hand raised. OK. <clears throat> um... Well, I was uh, I was uh, making a, a reflection about uh, what uh, Father Tony said about uh, this uh, 
the the reason of uh, attending this uh, this session mm. and the reason is uh, that uh, you know we discover more about about our heritage and uh, uh, about uh, also uh, the theology of uh, the these saints like uh, saint ephraim and uh, saint uh, uh, saint jacob of Saroj and uh, other the, uh, other the, theologians of the Syriac uh, Church sure. and the Maronite, uh, especially that, for example, in our office, like the Maronite uh, office, the Shinto and uh, the the Fankitos, they are full of uh, bautos and uh, about other form of like uh, melodies of uh, the Syriac uh, Church that are from St. Ephraim and St. Jacob, and uh, we, we use them in the office. Uh, uh, so uh, it's nice to discover, to see, to locate every pattern and everything uh, where it is uh, exactly. And, and regarding, and, sorry. And, and I want you all to know that it's important for you to know that Father Emmanuel is a monk and he knows the inside of monasteries. <laughs> Yeah, and how to pray true. in Syriac, and yeah, I I used also like uh, to write to copy manuscripts, and uh, this made me uh, more uh, with uh, you know more knowledge with vocabulary and more knowledge with uh, the Syriac environment. Uh, so uh, and uh, the calligraphy about the Syriac and the uh, Strangelo and the uh, Certo and the Chaldean. So um, it's nice uh, to uh, to discover all the you know the surrounding things about uh, this culture about and this, uh, yeah. the theology uh, theology and the spirituality, and uh, I I think that about the about Latinization. I felt like since uh, you know when I was in Lebanon, uh, always that like about. When you see these uh, books that were confirmed by the Vatican of, of our prayers and our uh, office and our mass, that uh, I feel that uh, the the Vatican was supportive. Like we have the the Maronite School uh, College in Rome that was established in the in the 15th century, 14th century. So they were the Vatican was supportive. But maybe they structured, uh, you know, uh, the mass, or they they influenced they influenced with the prayer because uh, most of our clergy were were getting their education uh, in uh, in Rome, but still they had their own uh, relationship with the Syriac uh, Aramaic uh, 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 office prayers. Uh, full of hymns of uh, you know Saint Ephraim and Saint Jacob, so they had the relationship with the Latin Church and with the, with their own culture, and this is what I uh, felt when I was in the novice period and uh, and later on when I was in Rome when I lived in in Rome uh, that we are in relationship through like our academic studies in the in a Catholic university like Saint Saint Thomas uh, Aquinas, the Angelicum. And in the same time, we were preserving our own office prayers and our relationship with uh, with our like the, th uh, the, the theologians, like uh, the Syriac uh, Syriac uh, Maronite uh, theologians, or Syriac uh, Antiochian, more Antiochian. So, uh, thanks, Father. Yeah. thanks for uh, sharing that. Good, good thoughts. Yeah, I was willing just to mention this uh, because yeah. of your question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Uh, we, we, have, we have just a few minutes left, which is a polite way of saying, <laughs> be brief and make your point. <laughs> no, I don't want to keep people beyond that. Right, Gilbert was, the, uh, was next. Gilbert, Gilbert's first. Yeah, I'm, can you all hear me? Yes. I'm delighted to be part of this uh, course. I'm a um, a Roman Catholic priest. Um, I belong to the Vincentian order in, in mm. Lebanon. They call us Lazarus. Mm. But uh, Vincent de Paul was our founder. But um, I, 
my mother's best friend growing up was a Lebanese American. So I got very familiar with food and culture, but there were no Maronite churches um, on the Gulf coast of Mississippi where I'm from. Oh. So they all went to the Latin uh, right churches, but they knew that they were Maronites. And so when I had the opportunity to, to participate in Maronite liturgy, um, actually when I was in San Antonio, Texas, uh, Bishop Zaidan was the pastor there. And he said, if I teach you the liturgy, can you help me out on a weekend? And I said, I'd love to. Uh, but I shortly afterwards, um, after I got faculties, I was transferred and worked out of the U.S. for, oh gosh, 23 years. And now I'm back in St. Louis and participating uh, at St. Raymond's. Uh, and Bishop Zaidan is, is working on my faculties. Uh, which, oh, good. Yeah. So I hope I'm, I'm so this is part of my formation for uh, for service to the to the eparchy, even if it's a part-time kind of way. Um, and I'm, I'm delighted uh, to be here and to see uh, other, other folks here from St. Raymond's as well. And Great. Father Don, I knew from way back when, because um, he was in Austin just up the road from San Antonio. But um, the second question, uh, which fascinates me, become, become who you are. Mm. I understand that our deepest identity as Christians uh, and as human beings is rooted in God. Mm -hmm. And for me to become who I am is to grow in my likeness to God. Um, and it's, it's, it's the whole goal of, of my life as a Christian and, and as a priest. Um, and the whole spirituality of, of, of growing, discovering, becoming who we are in God um, is, is certainly very present in the Maronite church in a more explicit way. Uh, I think so. Thank you. It's a real, um, boy, it's a real bit of wisdom from John the 23rd, isn't it? That it just hits you in the face. Become who you are. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Father Gilbert. Monsignor Charbel, uh, your hand was raised before. Right. Peace, everyone. Tony, Father Tony, thank you for your beautiful work and for presenting us tonight. Uh, to Tim um, Omali, we tell him that next breakfast is at Holy Family next Saturday, this Saturday at their <laughs> festival, and next weekend at our festival, Tim. So we look forward to seeing you. Uh, second thing, I think part of what uh, Tim also was mentioning that in Lebanon, uh, many of the universities are Latin, you know, uh, as far as the relationship between the Maronite and the Latin, whether the Jesuit, whether you know, there are many others, you know, Father Gilbert said, uh, Lazari in Beirut mm -hmm. and Ashrafi, mm -hmm. they have schools, they have uh, institutions, hospitals, and so on. And there's wonderful relationship. So we, many of the Maronites in Lebanon, sometimes they don't know that, you know, uh, Abu Nayaoub al-Kabushi is a capuchin, you know, he, he built some of, of the great uh, institutions in Lebanon where our kids go to school. They go, you know, it's, it's built and... Uh, and sponsored somehow by the Roman Rite Church, but there they have Maronite liturgies, even at the Capuchin churches. They have Latin for their nuns and so on, but they also have liturgies for the Maronite kids who attend there. So uh, I think, you know, you grow up knowing both tradition, and as George Eunice was saying earlier, Sabrikin is here, it's a little more confusing because our kids are going to the Roman Rite yeah. Church. Yeah. And, you know, the majority of the Roman Rite teachers, they don't know that there is a branch in the Catholic Church no. known as Maronites or, right. or Ukrainian or Ruthenian or Coptics or etc. So That's right. they ended up in looking at them as outsiders, not as part of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Yeah. And Good we point. as Maronites in our diocese, in our eparchies here, I think we had, we are still, we're getting there, but we are still at a identity crisis. You know, where are we fully Maronites? Are we, you know, influenced by the Roman rite? Uh, can we go mm. little here and little there and so on? Can our liturgy be mixed together? You know, we'll put some Latin hymns and some Byzantine hymns and so on. I think the idea of what you started with the, your friend, Pope John the 23rd, saying that what you have does not belong to you. It belongs to the Catholic Church. So they ask all the Eastern churches, to go and dig out their treasures and to share them with the with the Roman church, the whole church, the, the Catholic church. Yeah. And I think that's where we Maronites 
ought to work hard on our liturgy at least because liturgy is is the image of the of the church and so people when they come to us like Tim who came a couple of weeks ago you know we'll be able to understand what what the Maronite church is all about or the liturgy yep thank you yep well said thank you all right uh Kevin your hand was raised um uh, I'm a a, a retired uh, Roman Catholic priest, uh, and I've uh, recently uh, become uh, exposed to the encyclical Laudato, Laudato Si. And uh, I also am involved with conservation work and the, the notion of seeing God in creation and seeing the, the earth as an expression of, or a sacrament of God's presence. And uh, I, I've, I've read, read a book called The Divine Ideas Tradition, where this Episcopal priest and theologian is writing about the, the early <coughs> fathers being, being much closer to the incarnation and creation yeah. And the Greeks and, and Thomas Aquinas and all of the other characteristics of the Latin rite. And, and I, Tony, do you, uh, am I seeing something about the Maronite tradition that is, uh, is syncopatical with, uh, with the creation and, yeah. uh, and the incarnation? I hope, Kevin, that we've, we've lunched together too. <laughs> Um, and talked. When we come to St. Ephraim, you'll see that's two of the biggest things he talks about, incarnation and creation. Absolutely. Great. Uh, Samar? Yes, hi everyone. Hi. Hope you're all well. <laughs> Um, so I posted the, the large question there. Um, did you all read it? So I, no. Um, okay, basically, um, my observations as a Maronite, um, and who, who's also gone, who goes to Latin Mass, um, I just find they have a degree of reverence in their um, Mass style that is, like, blows my mind, um, that is just so beautiful, and respectful mm -hmm. and just full of truth. And that is, that's something that attracts me. Which, um, which, which one, Sama? Latin um, or, or Maronite? The, La the traditional Latin mass. Oh, tradition. I see. I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I just like, I, you know, I'm looking for a fullness of my identity as a Maronite <laughs> because I'm always looking for truth and beauty. Um, and I feel like some of these things have been removed. Um, they're not there anymore. I, you know, I feel like something's missing. And I think people want that, want that back. Okay. Thank you, Carol. Oh, Carol, you need to unmute yourself. Un unmute, yeah. I'm here because I want to learn more about my roots. I was brought up Roman Catholic, but I've been with um, Our Lady's Maronite Church with Corp Bishop Don for since 1987. And I, even though Corp Bishop Don has taught a lot about the history, I still don't feel like I have retained enough. And I thought by this class, I can immerse myself and learn more and who I become is maybe a better Maronite and more Christ-like. And that's what my goal would be. Absolutely. Uh, I, hope, I hope what we talk about in the next five weeks <clears throat> will help you at better attain that goal. I'm pretty sure it will. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We'll see. Ask me at the end. <laughs> yeah, of course. When when you have to write the paper. Right. <laughs> okay. Interesting comments and thank you for them. 
Um, and once again, Yvette, you're the best. If you um, mother those three young kids, the way you navigate this technology, they're gonna be the best. <laughs> <laughs> She's really Thank great. Thank you, I hope so. <laughs> we're lucky, we we're lucky to have her working for the FRT. Ah, uh, thank you. Okay, well, we'll see you in a week. Okay, now are we meeting on Thursday? Well, are you you can, there's a parallel one, but um, if you want to- But you're just every Tuesday. I'm every Tuesday. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Father Bong. Thank you, Father. I'm, uh, where's, uh, Father Emmanuel, I'm going to get those apples off your tree next Saturday. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> and I'll come to the uh, vigil liturgy and then walk right out to the festival. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Tim, Looking forward to see you. Tim, he wants you to come. I want you to come. Good yeah. Lebanese food. True. <laughs> Most welcome, anyway, anyway, everyone. All right, thank you. Great um, I'm ending the meeting now. Okay.